Today is Friday, February 13th, Friday the 13th. My name is Mark DePue. I'm a volunteer with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Oral History Program, and we're here with part two with uh, Phil Nelson. How are you this morning? Oh, you're doing good. Uh, it's a lucky day for me to have a chance to interview you. I hope you feel the same way. Looking forward to it, actually. We had uh, a great talk the last time. I was about a month ago when we were talking, and we spent most of that time period talking about your life as a farmer and the challenges that you had seen as farming has uh, evolved over these last couple decades. I want to just finish off with one other comment here, a question in terms of farming, because I noticed that you've got a plaque out there, a Master Farmer Award in 2001. Tell us a little bit about what it takes to earn that distinction. Well, I, I was very fortunate to be nominated by uh, my local county farm bureau, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, on an annual basis, uh, the Prairie Farmer uh, magazine honors four individuals um, who have contributed to not only uh, organizational work, but their communities uh, and basically their family involvement in agriculture. So I was uh, very fortunate to be selected that year uh, to receive that prestigious award. Okay, well that's the perfect segue, if you will, into what we want to really concentrate on today, and that's the Illinois Farm Bureau and your involvement with it. So, you're dressed appropriately today. <laughs> well, we, we uh, wear the Farm Bureau colors quite well. Okay, what are the Farm Bureau colors? Red and white and black? Very good. Okay, excellent. Okay. Um, tell us about your early experience with the Farm Bureau, how you got involved in the first place. Well, actually, uh, it was kind of a unique experience because I was a state FFA officer and uh, I helped open the convention back in 1976 uh, at the Illinois Farm Bureau Convention in Chicago. And the president at that time was Harold Steele. And Harold uh, happens to be um, a good friend of our family, uh, lives about an hour from us, and he was presiding over that meeting at that time and I was so impressed by the way that not only uh, he spoke of uh, agriculture, but uh, his professionalism of running the delegate session in solving and talking about a number of the issues that I went back home, became a member of our Young Farmer Committee at that time in LaSalle County, and uh, through the years uh, became more involved in this organization. And I'm um, uh, in his particular uh, position at this point in time representing the organization as president. Well, I'm sure you're aware that we've had an opportunity to interview Harold about his experiences as well, so we kind of got the bookends, of, so to speak. Um, what else drew you to the Illinois Farm Bureau? What was it about the organization beyond being impressed with Harold himself? Well, as a young farmer, um, you know, I watched my dad and grandfather, both uh, were leaders in our local county farm bureau. My dad preceded me on the board of directors. My grandfather preceded him. Uh, it really was an organization that has a lot of clout in our community. Uh, by clout, I mean it's very active and involved with the local units of government. And it always seemed to me as a kid growing up on a dairy farm that, um, you know, you look to, to groups to try to address your problems. Uh, whether it was roads or bridges or uh, whether it was issues that impacted a particular facet of what you did uh, in the dairy industry, Farm Bureau did that. Mm -hmm. So really that involvement got me back to the, the uh, involvement in LaSalle County at the young farmer level and I continued that. But were there other options, other groups that you could uh, get involved with? I'm thinking of the Farmers Union or the Grange or other groups. Well, those two groups weren't very active in LaSalle County. Um, actually, I think I'm fairly unique uh, as president of this organization because I was very involved in the Illinois Soybean Association as well as the Illinois pork producers. Uh, being a pork producer, uh, being a grain farmer, uh, I became very active in those organizations. And prior to, to being president of LaSalle County Farm Bureau, uh, at the same time, I happened to be president of the Illinois Soybean Association. I also served as vice president of the American Soybean Association and was very active in our pork producers. So I brought that commodity aspect uh, of those organizations to the uh, table when I ran uh, for this particular job. 
Um, well, that gets us to the next question then. Uh, you ran for this. You sought this position out. Is that correct? I did. Uh, back, uh, actually, about 10 years ago, I ran for vice president of the Illinois Farm Bureau. Uh, we had a, a four-person race, uh, two board members at that time, two county presidents uh, vied for that position. So it was really a wide open field. Uh, we campaigned statewide. Uh, this organization uh, is not just an election of the, off of the board. It's a statewide office, just like it is in, in units of government. So I was successful, and then uh, four years after that, my predecessor retired, uh, announced his retirement, and then uh, I ran for president uh, uncontested. So I've been fortunate not to have any opposition uh, to this point in time uh, serving as president of the organization. What's the method that the president and vice president at some of these positions are, are elected? Is it uh, statewide with all of the members voting? Yes, it is. Uh, we um, have a convention annually in December. Uh, the voting delegates have a, uh, a vote based on their membership back in their particular counties and they elect the president and the vice president every two years. We have a 10-year in Illinois Farm Bureau. We can serve five two-year terms, which is 10 years, 10-year. And, uh, and the board also has that same 10-year policy as well. Okay, here's a question you might not have expected. Give us your stump speech when you were first running for the presidency. What well, were the issues? Well, I, I basically said that we needed to do a better job of communicating uh, between the county uh, and the state. Uh, and not to say that we weren't doing that, but communication is critical in this job. When you have 420,000 members, whether it's the associate member or the farmer member, they want to know what they're getting for their membership dollars. I think that's very important. Secondly, I said that we needed to be a recognized and uh, a formidable voice in, in Springfield. That's a t challenge in its own right. Uh, as a nonpartisan organization working on both sides of the aisle, I think we've restored that. Uh, I think we're very much pointed to when it comes to ag issues uh, as a go-to organization. And I said thirdly, uh, we want to be a recognized voice on the national scene on national issues that impact agriculture. And really those three things I think we've been very successful at uh, under the leadership of uh, my administration when we came in as well as the board of directors. Okay. What are the other organizations, farming organizations at the state level that are out there that are also competing for members? Well, we're fairly unique in our state. Uh, about 85% of all the farmers that uh, are involved in production agriculture are a member of our organization. So we have a pretty strong base. Uh, there still is the Farmers Union. Uh, they have a much smaller representation as it relates to an ag general farm organization. It's really Farm Bureau and Farmers Union that are the two largest contenders for that. We have a number of commodity groups uh, in Illinois. We have the Illinois Soybean Association, Illinois Corn Growers, uh, we have the pork producers, the cattlemen, um, we have the dairy organizations, as well as we've, we've had some new organizations that have started. Uh, the Vintners uh, Association, we are starting to have quite a bit of presence as it relates to the grape industry mm -hmm. in Illinois. So, well, Illinois is a very diverse uh, state as it relates to ag organizations. If you're a member of some of these other commodity organizations, could you, would it be likely you're also a member of the uh, Illinois Farm Bureau? Yes, and I think I'm a living example of that. Uh, our uh, particular farming operation uh, is a member of the corn, the soybeans, the cattle, the hogs, uh, in addition okay. to being a Farm Bureau member. How about, are you, is it likely that you can be a member of the Farmers Union as well as the Illinois Farm Bureau? We do have people that are members of both. And I think part of it is they, they want to make sure that they have representation. And there is, I think, a little bit of difference in philosophical opinions between the two. Uh, we've always been that organization that believes in free, fair, and uh, open marketplaces to price your commodities. I think uh, we've always, you know, had that uh, entrepreneurial spirit in Farm Bureau that 
we can make the best even better. Um, and I think that's a little bit different than some of the other organizations. But uh, overall, you know, we all try to work together. We, uh, Illinois Farm Bureau, created the Illinois Ag Roundtable, which brings all of the organizations to the table twice a year to try to discuss issues and bring commonality to those issues. Okay. Uh, those are some great, very diplomatic answers to these questions. Tell us the distinctions, though, the specific distinctions between your organizations and the Farmers Union, for example. Well, on trade, we're very different. Uh, as I just said, we believe in more openness in trade and trying to uh, find markets for our producers. They, um, they don't necessarily agree to that uh, aspect of it. Uh, we've, um, we've, I guess, differed on that, uh, on trade policy issues. Um, along those lines many times. And at the Ag Roundtable, by consensus, if we don't agree, we don't move that issue forward. And that's one of those issues. But I'm still not clear exactly where the Farmers Union would come down on the trade issue. They're, they can't be opposed to it, are they? they uh, they're, they're probably not totally opposed, but they don't believe in some of the same access agreements that we do as an organization. I think secondly, philosophically speaking, um, they're more, they believe in more um, regulations than what we do. Uh, we sometimes uh, disagree on that. Um, you know, overall, they, they haven't had quite the, um, the PR spin as far as trying to get out in front on some of the issues. Now, under the Obama administration, the National Farmers Union has made, I think, some strides in trying to get the, the communication side of letting their members know that they tend to tilt more towards the Democratic Party, uh, where American Farm Bureau, our philosophy, at times, will tilt a little bit more to the middle or more to the Republican side. But given the fact that our state is uh, controlled by Democrats at almost every level, we do have to work across the aisles, and I think we've proven that we can do that. Um, is the Farmers Union then generally, and, and this is a historical question as much as anything, um, more sympathetic to a greater government involvement with farming, government subsidies programs, uh, those kinds of issues? I think it would tilt in that direction. I, I think, as I said, I think they're a little bit more protectionistic on trade. Uh, the, the permanent uh, normal trade agreement uh, with China uh, was a good example. They did not support that uh, because they looked at trade at, from a one-way street as far as us shipping things out but not allowing access to other commodities in. And we've had that same discussion on the national scene and international scene with the World Trade Organization. Uh, so would it be fair to say that Illinois Farm Bureau, the American Farm Bureau Federation, supports NAFTA, supports other similar agreements and that the Farmers Union generally sometimes does not? That would be a fair assessment of that. And I, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give a, a, a blanket statement that they don't you know, support any trade agreement, but some of those that you mentioned, NAFTA, uh, CAFTA, uh, as we looked at PNTR, um, they opposed many of those because of the stipulation that they did not uh, want the trade to flow both ways. How many members did you say that Illinois has in the Illinois Farm Bureau? We have 420,000 members, and the national organization has 6.2 million. And uh, what percentage of the Illinois farm population then are members? Between 85 and 90 percent are members of our organization. I assume there's annual dues that they have to be paying. They do. Uh, we have annualized dues, uh, and those will range anywhere from $42, I believe, is on the low side, uh, up to $75 to $100, and that is set at the county level. Well, farmers are a practical sort of people trying to balance their uh, checkbook at the end of the month. What do they want you to do on their behalf? Well, I think that there's a number of things on their wish list. Uh, Number one, they want you to be proactive and represent uh, their interests, and that can range everything from what we do on farm policy to regulatory relief or regulatory reform. 
Uh, they want you to stay on top of the issues. Uh, we've got a, a pendulum that is swinging both ways and, and you need to make sure that you understand what's creating those shifts on various issues, whether that's animal welfare, whether it's air emissions, uh, you name it, a uh, whole host of issues are on the table. And I think uh, probably mo more than anything else, they want to be communicated to know what's going on. We're a very unique organization. Uh, we cover communications efforts on a number of fronts. We've got our own radio station, uh, RFD Illinois, um, that basically we have members listen to daily. Secondly, every week we send the largest uh, uh, circulation-wise uh, farm newspaper uh, in the state called Farm Week uh, to our members so they see on a weekly basis what is going on and what are some of the hot button issues that we're working on and then to the associate members that 300 and some thousand uh, base that uh, belong to this organization because they believe in what we do we send a quarterly magazine called Partners uh, that keeps them abreast of the agriculture issues as well. So I think we, we have a very fine communication shop to try to get the message out and get the concerns out and the issues that we're working on to our members. Is there a lobbying, lobbying branch of Illinois Farm Bureau? Yes. At we, the state level? Yes. We are registered lobbyists in not only Springfield but in Washington, D.C. So uh, we can carry the ball, so to speak, on the issues that are important to to meet with legislators and, and certainly try to influence them uh, on the particular issues that we're working on. What are the issues right now? What's on the agenda? Well, on the state side, the state budget issue is probably the most pressing issue that we're trying to figure out how everything's going to shake out as it relates to the Illinois Department of Ag, uh, looking at ways to see how we're going to leverage uh, dollars uh, to uh, address infrastructure needs in this state. Farmers are big uh, consumers as it relates to transportation issues, whether it's moving their commodities on the waterways uh, uh, of Illinois, the Illinois River, the Mississippi River. Uh, we have a number of issues trying to upgrade our lock system. Uh, secondly, uh, not too many people have to go very far in Illinois to see some of the, the uh, situations that we're dealing with on roads and some of the problems that are associated with those roads as far as needing repair. The bridges in Illinois are in dire need of repair and replacement. And, and grain th trucks weigh an awful lot, don't they? They do, uh, but uh, you know, we're one of the few states in the Midwest that do not have access to 80,000 pound roads. And that's creating quite a challenge for our, our farmers as they move commodities. Well, talk about that in a little bit more detail. But let me finish the, okay. the last I'm thought sorry. on that. The rail system in Illinois is very important. Uh, right now, uh, we've got seven unit trains uh, that service, uh, uh, for the most part, the cattle feed yards in Texas. And, and some may think, well, what's that got to do with Illinois agriculture? Uh, last year, we shipped uh, 120 million bushel of uh, Illinois corn down to Hereford, Texas to feed cattle. So you look at all the elements of infrastructure Illinois agriculture touches every bit of them. Uh, but going back to your, your comment about roads, um, you know, it's been a concern of this organization over the last two or three years that we've been missing out on uh, tapping dollars to go to infrastructure needs right here in Illinois. As many people know, we've had a challenging budget situation the last two or three years. Uh, we haven't been able to match the, the funds that were uh, really directed at Illinois in the last highway bill or the last transportation bill. And we've watched billions of dollars go to other states because we haven't been able to access those. Well, to place this into a, a time frame here, and since you mentioned that, so I'll just mention that uh, uh, former Governor Blagojevich was just impeached, and uh, part of the ongoing discussion at the legislature, legislative level for the last three or four years was never being able to get to that uh, capital development fund and and it's a it's been a major disappointment uh, we have we have worked with uh, Senator Durbin uh, to say what can we do to put give some push to the General Assembly here in Illinois to try to put a capital bill together uh, to try to address that because you know shame on us uh, it, the last speaker of the house uh, from Illinois 
uh, really rolled up the shirt sleeves. And, and it was a bipartisan effort to say we need dollars in Illinois to address these uh, deteriorating transportation systems. So we've really been at the forefront of that issue and will continue to push till we, we are able to address it. Uh, where would Illinois Farm Bureau come down on state tax issues? The um, income tax versus property tax. Well, we've been a long proponent of looking at our taxing system here in Illinois. Matter of fact, for the last two decades, Illinois Farm Bureau has said, we've got to develop a system to fund education as an example of having less reliance on property taxes. As people grow older, uh, we think, feel that it's unfair to keep raising property taxes after their kids have, have went through the school systems and there needs to be a better way of equitably funding education because really that's one of the core issues at the funding issue. How do we increase the foundation level of funding for school districts? How do you address the capital needs of school districts ac across the state? And we've been at the forefront of that. Uh, we had the chief program change how Illinois education is financed as kind of a main staple of our group for the last two decades. And we've looked at various bills along the way. We, uh, we joined the A-plus coalition, which was a Chicago coalition, to look at changing how we finance education. So as it relates to the education centerpiece uh, of the funding side, we have said, you know, we need to look at probably raising the income tax and maybe giving some sort of a swap on the property tax uh, system that we have in this state. That is That was uh, proposed uh, the last couple of years, did not gain enough traction to make it out of committee uh, to have the particular uh, House and Senate voted on it. But I think uh, going into this session, I think everything is on the table looking at ways to not only look at the education uh, proponent, but we've got to look at the big picture when we've got a budget out of balance between four and six billion dollars and that doesn't even include the unfunded pension liability that we have in this state. We've got some challenging issues to address the revenue side as well as the expense side in trying to balance this budget. Are you suggesting then that the Illinois Farm Bureau would be in favor of an income tax increase but only if there is a corresponding reduction in property tax rates? Well, I think at this point in time, we're willing to look at anything that's going to be discussed. But uh, in the past, historically, I would favor your comment that we would say we'd look at raising the income tax if we could see some property tax relief. Because if you look at the property taxes in this state, they're some of the highest property taxes of any state in the country. If you look at the income tax, we are not in that situation. We're actually either in the middle of the pack or even on the lower side of that. So I think that's why the General Assembly right now is looking at those aspects uh, uh, of trying to put a capital bill together to address the infrastructure, looking at ways to, to get more revenue, and that might be an income tax, it might be a service tax. Uh, all those are basically being discussed behind closed doors as we speak. Well, I think when most people in Illinois think about property tax issues, they're thinking about the home they live in, in uh, Collar County of uh, you know, the Chicago area or downstate Illinois. Um, tell us a little bit about the difference or what's going on with property taxes on farmland, prime farmland versus marginal farmland versus that house that somebody might own. Well, it, it's, I, I will tell you most of the taxes categorically have went up. I mean, I'm a homeowner as well. Uh, those property taxes on our home have, have went up just like yours probably have because of the services that basically you want in your local community. Uh, and that deals with everything from your school districts to what goes on in, in your local unit of government in the, in the township or the, the city that you reside. Secondly, uh, on the farmland side of it, as we've watched values of farmland go up, uh, over the last, you know, half a dozen years, uh, correspondingly, we've watched those property taxes go up, and you so look the at property tax goes up at the same percentage level that the value goes up. No, we have what is called the farmland assessment bill in this state, and there's a number of factors that go into that calculation 
to figure out the corresponding increase. And that deals with everything from the price of the commodity, the price of the farmland, interest rates that are being paid. Um, you know, there's a whole, uh, whole number of factors that go into that portfolio uh, to determine that assessment. The most it can go up in Illinois is 10% a year. We've watched that go up 10% a year the last couple of years. At the same time, if you saw a dramatic drop, the most it could go down would be that. So part of that formula has a cushion built in to keep it from going up 30% or down 30% all in one year. So it's, it's worked well uh, in this state since we put it in uh, many years ago, and it tries to give that stabilizing impact to the local taxing units. From your perspective, from the Farm Bureau's perspective, is that tax burden on fine farmland reasonable? Well, depends on who you talk to. Uh, I will tell you, uh, coming from the northeastern part of the state, we've got farmers that are paying up to $60 an acre just in taxes, uh, where you might get down to southern Illinois and those taxes will be 5 to $10 an acre. So and you've got everybody in between. Um, where urban sprawl has taken place, and we've had these boom of subdivisions that have been built over the last decade, uh, that's where you see the greatest pressure on uh, property taxes as it relates to farmland. Mm -hmm. So is it fair? It's probably uh, the most equitable way of, of uh, calculating taxes that we have seen. It, it compares very similar to adjacent states as well. I'll put you on the spot here. Uh, some of the discussion right now on uh, tax issues is currently, what is it, 3.5%? For income tax, three percent. Three percent to go up to four percent. What kind of a percentage reduction would you hope to see, corresponding on the uh, property tax side? Well, we'd like to see maybe ten to twenty percent, uh, and that's and I'm working off of those figures based on a bill that we looked at last year. Um, when you, but we were also looking at a larger income tax increase if we were going to look at this swap. Uh, between property taxes and income tax. The 1% uh, rise in the state income tax to go from 3 to 4, depending on whose numbers you look at, will be anywhere from 3.5 to $4 billion in fusion of capital. That would almost plug the state deficit's uh, budget. Uh, but having said that, then you ask the question, what are you going to do to help fund some of the issues in education? Is that going to be a part of that, or does that just stop the bleeding in the budget? So I think in looking at that, they're probably looking at, at a larger, um, you know, uh, area that, or a larger compilation of trying to address the revenue side, i.e. a capital bill to take care of the, the infrastructure situations that we've talked about. Maybe you look at the state income tax increase as a way to plug the hole, and then maybe there's other things that they'll put on the table before we get done with this. But, I mean, we're all guessing at this point in time, but everybody's looking at budgets. Uh, the governor's looking at budgets uh, right now of cutting the individual agency budgets uh, between now and June, uh, 1%, and that will, that will uh, have some budget savings on the line. But agriculture is not going to go through this unscathed, and we're, we've got to figure out what our priorities are as it relates to the Department of Ag budget and what, as an organization, we'd be willing to put on the table to try to cure some of the problems of the state. What is the, uh, the Bureau's relationship with the Department of Agriculture? It's a very good one. Uh, we have a very close working relationship with the director and a number of the people in the department. As, as you can expect, uh, a number of the issues that we work on in our organization uh, touch what they do as an agency. So. I think we've had a very long-standing uh, uh, good relationship. Uh, we meet very frequently and very often on a number of the issues we're working on. Well, farmers tend to be a rather independent sort of folks. Uh, what are their expectations of what they want their state government through the Department of Agriculture to be doing for them? Well, I think they want them to be the spokes, spokesman, uh, spokesperson or agriculture within the governor's office. Uh, I mean, that's an appointed position here in this state. So you serve at the uh, pleasure of the governor, and sometimes the governor can come up with 
uh, some unique positions that might be very contrary to our organization. So I think we want that person to be very articulate and uh, very uh, much in a leadership uh, capacity of making sure the governor understands the importance of agriculture in this state. We're the number one industry. We have almost a million people in this state who touch some form of agriculture on an annual basis. So it's a big industry and one that needs to be looked after in the governor's mansion as well as the Department of Ag. Uh, oftentimes overlooked, uh, how important is it for the Department of Agriculture to run the state fair correctly and the county fair activities as well? Well, that's just one small facet of what the department does. Uh, it's kind of the communications or the PR side of the Department of Ag, but it's far from just the only thing that they do. Uh, you know, county fairs have been a long staple of the history, the rich history of our state. I mean, we've got one of the longest running fairs uh, that we go to and exhibit our livestock at in, in uh, DeKalb County, the Sandwich Fair. Probably the largest county fair in the state and you see it as people just love to attend that so they can see what agriculture is doing. And really, the fairs, whether it's a county or a state fair, it's really a showcase of agriculture. Uh, the Illinois State Fair has had its struggles uh, trying to make money, uh, as well as the one in DuCoin. But, um, you know, right now, uh, I think uh, you have to look long and hard to figure out what these fairs do as far as providing that service, providing that communications, and figure out a way to, to make them make money. Because like anything else, everybody is looking at all avenues to make sure that um, you know they're at least budget neutral uh, as it relates to a state budget item. Okay, I'm gonna change gears here a little bit and um, get you back in that mode of thinking about running for this office or actually running the office. Um, and put you in the awkward position of bragging about yourself a little bit. What are the skills and attributes you think you bring to the organization? The reason you ran in the first place? Well, as I said before, I think I'm a unique president of this organization uh, from the standpoint I was very involved in commodity organizations prior to coming to Illinois Farm Bureau. And I think that's important because in this position, you've got to be able to work with people and you've got to be able to work with organizations. I think I do that, uh, whether it's you know, a soybean organization or a cattle organization or a pork producer organization. You've got to reach across these territorial lines of commodity groups and farm organizations. I think that Farm Bureau, um, you know, its strongest asset is the people. So you've got to reach out and work with those people if it's in the very southern tip of Illinois to the northern tip of Illinois, uh, those are all members of this organization. So I hope that we, we do do a good job communicating, but I think, I hope that I also bring the unique, uh, uh, I guess, leadership attribute of being kind of tested before I walked into this job. And, um, and I try to represent the members as best I can in Springfield and Washington. DC uh, on the various issues we work on. Um, go back to that initial election then. Uh, I don't know that we have to necessarily name names here, but what margin of victory did you win by? Well, I almost uh, was elected on the first ballot and on a field of four people uh, to pull it off on one ballot, I, I think spoke very well. You I was the majority vote then? Yes. More than a plurality. Yes. So we, we almost won it on ballot one, um, which I guess, you know, that makes you feel good that, that people put that type of trust in you to run the organization. Sounds like you did quite a bit of travel, though. It, uh, it makes you better appreciate what the statewide office holders in government go through because you're dealing with everybody from the very southern tip of Illinois to the northern to the east to the west. and. Uh, we have 18 districts in Illinois Farm Bureau, and uh, we made an appearance in every one of those districts and uh, made our presentation of why we wanted to hold this particular office. How did you find time to do that while you're also running a farm? It uh, makes it very difficult, but I've, I'm very fortunate to have mm -hmm. a very understanding wife 
who's not only uh, my best friend, but also the partner in the organization that keeps the home fires burning when I'm not there. I have a son uh, who's very active in our farming operation as well. So I'm very fortunate to have that because you cannot serve as the S chief executive officer of Illinois Farm Bureau if you don't have a support staff back home. Well, that talks quite a bit about the evolution in farming in terms of that relationship between the husband and wife and the roles that they play as well. Well, my wife is very engaged in a number of the issues we're working on, um, but she also has to manage two kids in my absence as well as a couple employees that we have uh, in our operation. So, you know, the, the farm wife today uh, is just as active as being a partner in farming organizations as, as the, the farmer himself because they do a lot of the marketing, uh, they do a lot of the communication, uh, they, they, they're the accountant, the bookkeeper. So, you know, I can say on behalf of my wife, uh, she's just as instrumental in this organization as I am. Is she then doing the marketing and, and balancing the books and doing the finance, making financial decisions? We work together, but she does take the lead role, especially when you get into some of these months of the year where we're very much uh, involved and entrenched in Farm Bureau issues and we do a lot of traveling. Um, she, she pretty much takes the reins over during those times of year. Well, talking to other farmers, I've gotten the distinct impression a success or failure oftentimes hinges on market decisions. When do I sell? Can you talk about those kinds of decisions and the challenges? Maybe get some specificity to it? Well, farmers are price takers, not price makers. And I will tell you, this last year was a good example that we had corn prices in excess of $7 a bushel. Uh, then it went into a free fall and we had corn uh, this last fall when the combines were rolling down to $2.50 a bushel that pendulum swung quite dramatically and with that uh, input costs went through the roof. So if farmers did not lock in some of their prices towards the top end of that uh, price uh, opportunity, uh, it really puts you behind the eight ball and trying to remain profitable because your break even cost is somewhat in the middle of that pendulum shift, uh, somewhere around four dollars a bushel. And uh, at the same time you can't control your input rise because those decisions are made in corporate boardrooms by multinational companies and you're per pretty much at the mercy of the market. The one thing you can do in controlling your destiny is try to do a better job of marketing and we've always had the goal in our farming operation and a lot of farmers have that same goal is to be in that top third. You'll never hit the high and hopefully you never hit the low but you try to figure out where your profit margins are at and try to lock those in respectively. When you're saying locking in things, you're talking about grain that's already been harvested that might be stored on, on your particular farm, or are you talking about corn and, and soybeans that are in the field that hasn't even been harvested yet? All of the above. You're talking about farmers that are pricing commodities, in some cases, two years out, that haven't even been put into a ground or even thought about you're talking about farmers that have corn that's in the field growing, and you're talking about farmers that have harvested a crop and may have it in storage. So a time frame or a time window is fairly large in the life of a farmer in trying to manage their risk. And going back to the role of wives oftentimes on these family farms, and they're, are they watching those commodity prices go up and down as much as the, the men are? Yes, they are. And uh, we have most farmers uh, through either computers or standalone boxes uh, watch the ticks uh, on a daily basis or hourly basis. And the, the volatility in the marketplace today is probably as great as it's ever been. And that's why marketing is very important. It is a part of our organization here at Illinois Farm Bureau. Uh, we started uh, AgriVisor back many years ago as a means to have a set of experts uh, watching and monitoring market trends, fundamentals, technicals in the marketplace and trying to give farmers advice on that. We took that to a new level two years ago, and the leadership of the board of directors to 
make a, a new marketing service that not only marries that marketing expertise um, with the markets, but it marries it with crop insurance. So a farmer now has the whole ability to try to protect themselves through utilizing uh, risk management uh, uh, products that are out there in crop insurance with a marketing plan to try to pull some of the volatility out of the marketplace and, and try to ensure a profit. You guys are the ultimate gamblers in American society then. Well, we are because nobody, I think, can see the volatility like a farmer because not only volatility in the marketplace, but nobody can guarantee you you're going to have a perfect crop next year because we do not rely on God and Mother Nature as to whether you're going to get enough rain at the right time. Last year was a good example in this state. Almost a third of our state uh, fell into a dismal start given the facts of the flooding on the western part of the state on the Mississippi, a levee breaking in the southeastern part of the state, and then we had the delayed start in the southern part of the state due to wet weather. So we not only deal with Mother Nature, uh, we deal with the markets, we deal with government intervention that has a dramatic impact on our bottom lines. Well, since we've been talking about markets as well, um, does your job have an aspect of a lot of overseas travel? We, uh, we have made the, uh, the flights uh, and the trips many times to many various destinations. Um, you know, it can be everything with, uh, I guess, uh, going down to South America and visiting with farmers to being a part of the World Trade Organization talks in Geneva, Switzerland, and all of the above. And, um, and I think that makes it unique. You know, farmers are farmers, whether they're in central Illinois or in central Costa Rica. They all, uh, you know, have that optimism about growing a crop. They have that belief that you're doing something uh, to grow food for people around the world. And given the global uh, climate that we're a part of in production agriculture, we need to recognize where our competition is at, what we can do better here in this country as far as adapting technology as opposed to a farmer in Brazil or in Russia or in Argentina. I mean, we, we very much, I think, study and watch what farmers in other parts of the world are doing. And being on the American Farm Bureau Board of Directors, we have a farmer to farmer exchange trip once a year to various parts of the world to try to bridge that gap and understand what they're doing. You're an ambassador for American farmers when you're doing that? Yes, we are. We not only represent farmers, but we're representing the country in meeting with dignitaries and other ministers of agriculture and such. Uh, are there a couple of those trips that are especially memorable that you can talk about? Well, back in the uh, late 90s, I was uh, a part of the American Soybean Association, and at that time, we were trying to uh, uh, reach a, a deal in the Uruguay round of talks, and uh, we were in uh, France uh, meeting with French farmers about the fact that they were unfairly uh, dumping oil seeds on the world market below the cost of their production and below the cost of our production. And we really reached an impasse. But I had the opportunity to be in France for about a week. And I visited with a number of French farmers and really developed quite a rapport with them. And as a result of that meeting, about two weeks later, we had the infamous Blair House Agreement, which basically said to France, and France said to us, we need to reach a resolve of not trying to put one farmer or another farmer out of business. And we've had that Blair House Agreement in place for now almost a decade. And I think that's one of the benefits of a world trading organization is you try to resolve these disputes before it really gets too far to the point that um, one industry or one type of farmer is put out of business because somebody else is not playing really by the same rules. I'm not. I I think I understand, but I think I need some more clarification when you say one type of farmer going out of business. What kind of uh, market forces would cause that to happen? Well, in the case that I just uh, described, they were dropping oil seeds. Say, say that it cost our uh, oil seed producers, a soybean farmer in this country, 
uh, had uh, break-even costs of six or seven dollars a bushel. They were dropping beans on the market at about three dollars a bushel. Well, you can't stay in business very long if you get that type of production on the market uh, below you uh, to try to respond to that. You can't change enough in your farming operation to make that happen. Um, good example of that right here in this state was the bell pepper uh, plant uh, just outside of Decatur. They ran uh, into the same situation. They had a state-of-the-art facility. They were doing very well, but all of a sudden some peppers started coming in from other countries well below their cost of production and within uh, six months they were out of business. So those are some of the tariffs and some of the trade issues that we deal with as an organization. What's the clout that the WTO has? Well, we have 136 member countries in that organization. The problem is you don't have everybody. Russia, uh, as an example, is still not a part of that. The cloud is, is that you try to get the member countries to sit around the table and try to strike some resolve on some of these issues. The unfortunate thing to try to get 136 countries to agree on something is very difficult. And that's one of the impasses that we've seen in this last round of talks that we weren't able to get all the agreements. And it isn't, agriculture is just one piece of those whole trade talks. I mean, you're dealing with technology, you're dealing with pharmaceuticals, and agriculture um, is certainly one that, that everybody talks about, but it's not the only one in that particular trade discussion. Okay. Uh, you mentioned you've been to other countries as well, obviously, in the process of doing this. Anything strike you, really struck you, when you're comparing how agriculture is done in the United States versus places like France or maybe in uh, some other places you've been? Oh, it's, it, it's all across the board. I mean, uh, and I'll take, you know, during the North American Free Trade Agreement discussions, we were in Mexico uh, two or three times uh, that I recall, and you look at their particular point uh, that those Mexican farmers deal with in raising crops and livestock versus the technology that we have in this country. And I have said it many times that it's nice to go on those trade trips. It's nice to get to meet other people from other parts of the world. But you just thank God every time when you come back home that there's no better place than where we reside and live right now um, to have our farming operations. I think the biggest difference that I see is how we respond with technology transfer in this country. And, and I'll put France in that category and the United States. They have a lot more resistance to technology than we do as farmers in this country. Part of that is some of the organizations, Greenpeace, biotechnology is a good example where they have resisted it. And some of that has been social pressure by some of these activist organizations where I think the French farmers see what we do in this country and how we adapt to technology and use that technology. They can't do it because of some of the political and social pressures. That's an example of that. Uh, in Mexico, if you look at the way that uh, we raise our livestock as an example in our country and in our farming operation versus the dirt lots and, and some of the uh, um, I guess sanitary issues that I saw in that particular country versus where you have the USDA stamp of approval, you see the safety and the biosafety that we put in our particular food um, uh, value chain compared to like the Mexicans. I think it's very different. So, you know, I'm very proud of the organization and the network and the regulate, regulatory framework that we have in this country that produces a safe food supply. Well, one of the this is fascinating because on the drive into work today, I'm listening to uh, um, something on the news talking about French resistance against Monsanto and genetically modified corn. Basically, is that an example of what you're talking about there? Yes, and um, they have long resisted uh, biotechnology, but I will tell you, if you talk to the French farmer they would like to use the technology, but they're prohibited from doing it to the degree that we accept and use it in this country. There is biotechnology in Europe, in, in France, but it's not used at near the scale 
that we use it here? Well, let's get a little bit specific in the GMOs especially. What is their objection to the GMOs? Well, that part of this goes back to Greenpeace, that they feel that not enough testing has been done. Um, we, in this country, go through a whole host of regulatory hoops before a genetic event can be introduced into this country. What we need to do is get to a standardization of guidelines and procedures on the international front because the reason I say that, Europe has one set of criteria, Japan has another set of criteria. I served on the very first uh, U United States Department of Agriculture Biotechnology Advisory Committee and at that time we were dealing with the Starlink episode where the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, issued a split registration for food and feed. And that got us in trouble because you cannot have quite the channeling to eliminate any con contamination within okay. the two different aspects. I, I wonder if you can go in, again a little bit more detail on the Starlink incident. What's really, what was really going on there? Well, first of all, you know, nobody was harmed on this, but it was due, due to testing protocol they determined that some of the events that were in that biotechnology corn uh, made it into a food channel. Um, and it was detected early, and we were lucky to, to pull it out of there. It was supposed to be just used on the feeding side into livestock is what it was approved for. Was some of this, again, to get more specifics into it, was some of this a, ma a matter of uh, pollen from a GMO field? Um, blowing over to another field that yes. wasn't supposed to be that's gamma. actually it was pollen drift and whether the setbacks between a a non GMO field and this GMO field that contains Starlink if those setbacks were not far enough back or in, in the case of our uh, committee we were finding out that we were finding pollen drift uh, almost a mile away on a particular uh, uh, contamination or contaminated field. So out of that, and this fast forwards to where, where the French are going, they're using it as a trade dispute more than anything to try to not allow certain crops to get into the marketplace. But they're standing behind some of the political and social aspects of this where they say that not enough testing has been done. Prior, uh, since that uh, Starlink episode, we have put in place for GMO and non-GMO crops further setbacks to reduce uh, pollen drift. Uh, we've also tried to channel uh, certain segments of certain events that may not be approved on the international scene but are approved on the, uh, the national scene here to try to eliminate some of that contamination uh, of the two different events that are in the marketplace. Are those federal laws, state laws, or agreements among people in the Farm Bureau, for example? Actually, uh, for the most part, they fall under federal laws and jurisdiction. We, um, in our organization, try to, we have put the Know Before You Grow campaign uh, front and center stage through our communications efforts so farmers understand when they buy a certain uh, type of seed or a certain type of event that's in that bag of seed, that they understand the setbacks, the refuge acres that you have to have around those events uh, before they plant them. So we've, we've learned from some of those, uh, I guess, uh, beginning uh, situations to where we are today, and I think we're, we're uh, at least managing them better than we did when they first came out. Well, it certainly addresses the complexity that farmers have to deal with today to be successful when you get into that discussion. Well, it, it, you know, what we're talking about with pollen drift and knowing where, where you planted a particular variety that falls under this event, that's just one aspect. Uh, the farmer also needs to clean out their, their spray equipment. They've got to clean out their, their uh, harvesting equipment to try to get the purest product that they can off of these particular um, types of uh, hybrids that they're planting for a particular market. So. You know, it's, it's a lot more complicated than I think a lot of people think about. But I think at the end of the day, I think we're managing it far better today than we were a decade ago. Okay. Um, 
we might run out of time in talking about this, but I wanted to address kind of the parallel dilemma when you get into livestock and marketing uh, hogs and, and cattle in places like the Japanese and the Korean market currently. And I'm especially thinking about uh, um, bad cow disease and uh, some of the other issues that really bit the livestock industry here lately. Well, we've had our share of challenges since the, uh, the, the cow that stole Christmas, so to speak, uh, and that happened to be the year that I came in as president of this organization. And uh, when they found that, that uh, infected cow in Washington State, and, um, and we're talking about mad cow disease. And the ironic thing has been, and I think this is an important point people need to understand, is even though we've had a half a dozen uh, issues with mad cow disease in this country, we have all found, or we have found those particular cattle at the rendering uh, aspect uh, of the food chain, which means, in essence, none of this got into the food supply. So I think that's, that's issue number one. Issue number two is how do we prospectively go forward in trying to make sure that we can ensure a safe food supply and at the same time address the, um, uh, the international trading market that um, we ship a lot of cattle and hogs and, and poultry to other aspects of this world. Uh, and that's where your Japan and Korea situation comes in. Um, we have tried to, as an organization, uh, impress upon our members that we have to ha do something to make sure that we can ensure that safe food supply, that we can do it in a short order if a particular suspect animal is found, that we can shut that down, get to the true source of where that animal came from to ensure that food supply. So we've went through premise ID, identification of livestock, we've went through you know, the, the whole national uh, mantra of trying to get those PREM IDs or a national identification system. That has caused uh, some angst in the ag community, uh, to say the least, uh, because people have some fears as to where that information, whether it's your premise or my neighbor's premise, where that information ends up, and can it be used against you at some point in time, there's a lot of privacy um, issues involved here. So we've, we've heard from the countryside, I think everybody wants to have a safe food supply. It's a matter of how much information they want to divulge to Big Brother, whether it's at the yeah. State Department uh, of Agriculture or at the United States Department. But it, Illinois is not an island on this. It's caused quite the uproar. Um, you might say nationwide, but you know, our biggest fear is that, you know, God forbid we don't have a breakout of the disease in any form of livestock as we're going through this discussion of trying to get to where we need to be. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that the Illinois Farm Bureau is in favor of fairly strict traceability kind of legislation. So you know where that, that hog is born all the way through butchering. Well, we have been in favor of a voluntary method of that. And, and by that, we're saying as an organization, you know, our producers keep good records. We know and when the hogs are harvested at a particular packing plant, uh, they have to be ID'd as to what farm they came off of. Really, hogs are almost there at 100% right now. The problem we get into is the cow-calf producer and the sale barn. and that's a larger chain of people that you're involved with. But uh, I, I will say that we are for a, fa a safe food supply, and we have supported a number of the measures as trying to make sure we maintain that. But the problem we get into from our membership's perspective as to who controls the information that is required and who has access to that information. Back to that stubborn, independent farmer spirit, huh? <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I will say part of the resistance, I think, has improved the process. There have been things that have been talked about through this whole premise ID process that has put in safeguards and protections of what is foyable and what is not. 
So that, I think, Oil has bowl, meaning. meaning freedom of information where a person such as yourself could get on a computer and find out, you know, who has what livestock, how many head of livestock, where are they located, that sort of thing. Um, so we've, we, I think, have achieved some, some good safeguards in the process of having this discussion. The, the bad part about the whole process has been it's taken an awful long time because, as you recall, you know, a year ago our director of ag, our previous director of ag, wanted to mandate any 4-H or FFA kid that showed at the state fair had to have a premise ID number. Well, that caused a lot of ruckus in the communities across this state. And a number of phone calls that came right into this office in regards to that stipulation. It is not a mandatory program mm -hmm. and has not been. But, you know, some people viewed it as a mandate. Even the Secretary of Agriculture at the federal level has said, no, this is a voluntary program. So that's where we're at right now in that, I would say, somewhat controversial issue. <laughs> okay, well, that's exactly why I like to ask about it. This is the time where we need to take a quick break, and we'll come right back at it and talk more about the Farm Bureau in terms of the other aspects of the organization. Okay. Thank you. 